Okay. It's that time of the show. It's time for John Doyle. But this isn't just any John Doyle. This is John Doyle's magnum opus. This is John Doyle's one hour and 42 minute feature length diatribe on adult entertainment. So this video is going to contain discussions of adult themes. If you're not okay with that for whatever reason or, you know, there are kids with an earshot, probably move away from them or have them move away from you. Either way, uh, it's probably going to get spicy in here. So we're going to have some discussions about this stuff while John Doyle, in a suit, fights against the urge to caress any parts of his body because that boy has a hair trigger, okay? This, this adult man has not had a release in probably since his last nocturnal emission when he was like 16. So he's a bit bottled up. And it turns out concentrated coom turns into fascism. So let's find out why he thinks porn's bad. Dive right into this because I have no idea how to properly start this video. And to be honest with you, I've been pretty anxious about making it, which is why we've been absent for a while, why it's taken so long to put out, because there's so much to cover. And I want to make sure that I do it in a way that is optimally thorough and digestible. And also because very few people actually talk about this issue. So watch it in parts if you have to. Just make sure that you watch the whole thing, because I think that this will end up being one of the most important videos that we've ever done. So I'll just start off by If one of the most important things you think you can tell other people is not to touch themselves you need to find better things to do with your time saying there is no greater threat to the future of our country than pornography not socialism not the left not big government pornography <laughs> the communists couldn't take down america but you know what will the bang bus and I'll prove that to you if you lend me your attention for however long this takes us to get through. Please bear with me, hear me out. But to summarize what I mean by that before we get into all the data and explanations, if you imagine any conflict that you have in your life or that we face as a society, you have to think of it as a zero-sum game. You have to focus on yourself just as much and perhaps even more than you're focusing uh, on your enemy. Like, it's not enough to say, well, you know, they're stupid. They're, they, they're incompetent. They don't know what they're doing. There's no way they could ever... How, why in the heck in chat? I am shocked that Twitch chat allows you to link to blacked.com or any pornography website for that matter like like just without any check it didn't even ask me to approve that message just straight up link to a porn website <laughs> god make that work or be successful because if you're not bringing anything to the table to push back against that to stand your ground then it really doesn't matter how foolish you think your enemy is. Eventually, they'll conquer you because any ground that they have gained is necessarily ground that you have seeded. It is a zero-sum game. And the reason this ties into pornography is that pornography is literally making us mentally ill. It is making us depressed. It is making us weak. It's making us numb and pacified. It's making us more impulsive and therefore more susceptible to propaganda. And again, we're going to get into all the data behind What What adult films are you partaking in, John, where you think these things are happening? This in great detail, but the point is that if you had something like that, something that was literally neurochemically breeding mental illness in practically the entire male population. Breeding mental illness? John, that's not how this works. I assume he'll probably try and cite some studies. I'm very interested if he'll even attempt to cite some study that says... <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> I apologize, I got something stuck in my throat. <clears throat> anyway, um, I'm curious if he's going to, like, cite any article that regular, or a journal or something that says that any sort of regular non-destructive use of pornography in your day-to-day -day life is going to hurt you in any way certainly like anything that releases like dopamine or any sort of pleasure chemicals there's the potential that you could get addicted to something there are absolutely people out there who have porn addictions um just like there are people out there who have you know addictions to anything that can make them feel good but that doesn't mean that porn as a whole is a bad thing right there are things that people enjoy like a slice of chocolate cake for instance that you can enjoy in moderation that you shouldn't have at the excessive levels that would cause someone to get obese. This is something that I struggle with and I continue to do so. And I'm trying to work towards a healthier me, walking out on the treadmill and stuff. Good stuff. The point is, everything in moderation, okay? 
You just don't spend all day, you know, in front of a computer doing the kind of things John is talking about. Most people don't use it in that way. Most people use it in a healthy way where it slots into their life. And not only that, but they can use it with partners. Like, that's a perfectly fine thing to do. Do you think that those men would ever be able to successfully push back against the left, against socialism, against the big <laughs> government, against anything, let alone feel like I would push life? back against the communists, but I'm so empty. I have no coom left in me. I've been jerking off to Brazzers all day, and I'm so dehydrated, I can't fight the commie menace. Does have meaning? No. A lot of this video is probably just going to be me making fun of his hyperbolic ridiculousness, but, you know, this is the video you signed up for, folks. No, what has happened to our men in the last 15 years is unprecedented throughout the history of the world. We're the guinea pigs. And what we're finding out is that the results of this are catastrophic for our brains, for our lives, for our society as a whole. And you can laugh at this if you want to, but it doesn't make it any less true. And again, I've got a mountain of data to back this up if you'll just bear with me. But first, I just want you to ask yourself a question, which is just very simply, am I addicted to pornography? You know, we're going to get into the nature of addiction later, but we know that 98% of men have accessed pornography in the last six months and that 80% of men have accessed it. Wait, do you think that accessing porn more than once in six months is an addiction to porn? Within the last week, ask yourself this question. When's the last time I went over a month without watching pornography or even two weeks? Your answer doesn't necessarily mean that you're addicted, but, you know. I don't know. When's the last time I, I drank a Coke? When's the last time I went a month without... I don't know. <sighs> Binging a TV show. Like, this matters in terms of, like, when's the last time you went a month without, I don't know, doing something incredibly destructive. You basically have to have a presuppositional belief that pornography is as inherently destructive as these things in order to care. If you were addicted, then the next question would be, okay, is this a bad addiction to have? Am I doing damage to myself, or is it exactly the same as people who just like to look at pictures of puppies all the time, which is an actual argument that we'll address later from the pornography addicts. But for now, <laughs> if you're a young man... I don't think I've ever heard that used as a comparison, literally ever. ...man who watches pornography, and you just so happen to feel depressed, to feel unmotivated to do things, even things that you used to enjoy. You feel socially anxious. You feel as though you have no control in your life. Maybe you seem to have some form of erectile dysfunction, even if you're very young. Maybe you don't get morning wood anymore. Uh, maybe you've had some encounters with women, and you weren't able to keep it up the whole time or maybe you need to fantasize about pornography or watch it at the same time in order to sustain yourself sort of vulgar so i apologize for that but you know maybe you're not even interacting with women maybe they're not even as appealing to you you don't feel very good about yourself you don't have self-confidence you have trouble concentrating on things you feel numb in everyday life if any sure you'd be describing someone who probably has a legitimate issue with impulse control in regard to their Viewership of adult material, that's absolutely a thing that happens. We agree, John, but that's not the typical experience people have. If this sounds like you, I need you to consider that your use of pornography is likely causing, or at the very least amplifying, some of these problems. And we can prove it scientifically, empirically, logically, anecdotally, whichever way you'd like. And I know this is an uncomfortable conversation to have, believe me. You should not really, I'm an adult. I'm fine with talking about sex. Do you know that adults do that, John? some of the emails I get about this stuff, but this is the most important conversation to be having because there is no greater threat to the well-being of the country than pornography. Because after a few generations of men experiencing the symptoms that we just listed, the country will collapse. Like, it simply can't survive that. No society has ever faced anything like this before. And if you care about this country, then you have to be disciplined. What do we always say? A disciplined mind is an effective mind. Aristotle said, I count him braver who overcomes his desires than him who conquers his enemies, for the hardest victory is over self. He also said, we are what we repeatedly do. And pornography is an attack on man, and by extension, an attack on the family, and by... <laughs> In what way? John, people have been producing pornography for as long as human beings have made depictions of things. Like, pornography is not a new thing. Now, certainly, like, all art, like, all creative endeavors... Uh, whether we're talking about TV shows or, or plays or movies or books or what have you, all entertainment, especially visual entertainment, has exploded, um, not just in the last century, but especially in the 21st century. We live in the era of peak TV. We also probably live in the era of peak porn. If you want to go find any random kink, you can go out there and you can find a video of it. And if you can't find it, you can go commission someone to make that for you. We live in an era where there is more porn and more entertainment than there has ever been. I would agree with that. But that doesn't mean pornography is a new thing. 
People have been looking at porn forever. Extension and attack on the society. And if we don't reverse course soon, our civilization simply will not survive. Like, we will be conquered by our enemies. Men who came before you didn't live like this, and you were never... <laughs> Men in the 1920s and 30s never ever masturbated. Masturbation was invented in 1976. Okay, did you know that? <laughs> did, Jimmy Carter invented masturbation in the Oval Office and it's all been downhill from there. <laughs> Would you like to see my peanuts? supposed to because pornography literally causes all of these problems and we know this because of what we can prove that it does to your neurochemistry and because of what we can prove that it does to your being like just because it's hard to conduct an experiment with the proper controls because of how widespread this issue is and how inherently private it is doesn't mean that you get to be like no this has been debunked sex positive psychologist told me so no and even that aside the studies that we do have are you preempting people debunking your shit by doing a meme Haha, -ha, I drew you with a silly hairdo in a meme. Ergo, your fact checking doesn't count. Checkmate, libs. <laughs> Explore this with the proper methodology, all aligned with our position. So, your opinion is invalid. Coom brain. A thousand percent increase in erectile dysfunction in the last 15 years. Hmm, wonder why that could be. What's changed? It's a real head scratcher, isn't it? The leftist porn addicts that are going to make pathetic response videos to this are going to be like, um, source, um, study, shut up, addict. <laughs> <laughs> That's a really, really good rebuttal to not having any sources for your bullshit claims. You're nailing it, John. Please keep going. You sacrifice the privilege of sympathy when you start rationalizing and trying to normalize your addiction throughout society so as to prevent yourself from realizing how weak you actually are. And that's the thing. They'll say, John, please just jerk off for the love of God. I don't think... I don't think your scrotum can handle the pressure anymore. Please. It's gonna, it's gonna be a disaster either way, but you need to let some of the pressure out or the pipe's gonna burst. Pornography addiction isn't real unless you're watching it at work or in public. Things like that, because they need to obfuscate symptoms of extreme, extreme addiction as just addiction in order to normalize their perversion throughout society. But to those who aren't coping, to those who don't think they're addicted, or to those who just aren't sure, here's my challenge to you. Detox for 60 days. And if you're not addicted, it shouldn't be a problem, right? And if you don't notice any significant improvements in your life, send me an email. Tell me I'm wrong. I'll send you a picture of myself eating my shorts, my pants. It's winter in Michigan. I'm not wearing shorts. Let's be realistic here. Seriously, why not quit? What do you have to lose? Worst case scenario, you just miss out on like, what, two months of doing something you like? I wish it were that simple. Unfortunately, it's not. What we're going to be talking about here is incredibly important. We're going to be very thorough, so please listen all the way through. We're going to go through the history and evolution of this problem, uh, the brain chemistry behind the addiction, the negative effects of that addiction on you as it pertains to your mental health, your sexual health, etc. And then we'll get into the negative effects that it has on society as it pertains to the family structure, women, etc. And then we'll debunk some of the most popular things claimed by the people who think that pornography is harmless or even healthy. We'll go over some of the ways that you can quit, and then we'll answer some of the most popular questions that you guys had from last time, because history suggests that we'll bounce back from the current trends in society. History suggests that, you know, eventually the hard times will create the strong men, right? Maybe, but the huge difference now is that- I often get how I think society functions and changes over time from memes. That's usually a good call. Everyone is pacified. Everyone is totally numb. Like, how do you prevent hard times from breeding strong men? sedate and distract them with pornography, drugs, mass media, consumerism, etc. And it's a huge problem. And if you end up resonating with what we talk about here, I implore you to share this video with every man in your life that you care about, regardless of their age, because it is incredibly important. So do stay tuned. It is imperative. Uh, I hate this intro. <laughs> Hello there, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to Heck Off Commie. It's officially the most wonderful time of the year. That time of year, the time of the year where I yell at the audience about porn. Love to see it. We knew it was coming. And the idea behind it, for those unfamiliar, is basically that there's this meme called No Nut November that we just got done with a couple months ago. A little late. And uh, the challenge is basically to go the entire month of November without masturbating, which means that a lot of guys see if they can make it a month without watching pornography. And then they almost invariably fail, dismiss it as a stupid internet challenge, and then go about their business. And so I'm here trying to kind of capitalize on some of that momentum so to speak along with the fact that it's the new year people are thinking a resolution it's interesting to me that he intrinsically links masturbating with porn often those things go together i'm not disagreeing especially because in this day and age the ease of access is crazy we all have 
you know, cell phones in our pocket that have access to the entire internet. And as Avenue Q taught us, we all know what the internet's for. So I find it interesting that he conflates the two when you can, in fact, in theory, watch porn without masturbating or you could masturbate without watching point porn. These are not things you have to do together. Just seems interesting, but whatever. We're over a month into the resolutions, whatever. I'm trying to explain why you should stop watching pornography. I made one of these about a year ago, uh, but I intentionally didn't watch it before making this to avoid repeating myself as much as possible because I want this video. Wouldn't that ensure you do repeat yourself as much as possible? I'd probably watch it just to know, okay, I already covered this, 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 and that. I don't need to cover those again. Video to be the best articulation of my position now, just like that video was the best articulation of my position then. That being said, I would highly recommend going back and watching the video from last year as well. I'll put a link to it in the description because tons of people found that video to be extraordinarily helpful and eye-opening. And that's actually, you know, what I kind of wanted to start out with. Like, firstly, my reasons for being against pornography have nothing to do with my religious beliefs. I was actually against pornography, believe it or not, before I really came into the faith. And I've learned that that's essentially the case with the vast majority. I find that pretty hard to believe considering what I've heard about your parents from people who went to school with you, John. <laughs> But okay. Majority of people who try to quit doing this stuff, the biggest online community that's related to this stuff did a survey on this and found that only 20% of people said that part of the reason that they were doing this as far as like quitting it um, was for their religion. Like the vast majority of people who are trying to quit are just trying to quit because they're tired of being controlled and weighed down by it. And when I posted a video on this last year, I expected everyone to just get mad at me, but it turns out that almost everyone was on board with what we were saying. And I can't prove this, but I have it on good authority that we- John, you always get incredibly positive stuff from your audience because no one outside of your- and we all live in echo chambers. I'm not saying I'm immune to this. Obviously, the people who watch my channel are very much going to agree with me because they already know me. And if they're watching me regularly, it's probably because we share similar beliefs. People tend to surround themselves with entertainment and people who talk. Uh, they surround themselves with people who agree with them, more or less. We like to have our opinions parroted back to us. We like to hear people who are similar to us give their opinions, even if they're slightly different. But like, John, your, your audience is entirely people like you. They're like alt-right weird like conservative people of course people in your audience agree with you every video you do has mostly upvotes just like most of my videos have mostly upvotes because my audience likes me and your audience likes you that's how it works we were the catalyst for the pornography debate that happened online about a year ago within the right because we made a video then coincidentally some bigger conservatives made some videos. People started talking about it. All good stuff. It's an important conversation to have, and we have to assert it into the mainstream dialogue because it's a cancer to our civilization. And I'll tell you that since I posted that video a year ago, I've received hundreds of messages, emails, letters from people literally all over the world. Fun fact, we actually have people watching this channel in literally almost every country in the world. There's only a handful that we're not reaching. That's your North Koreas, your Sudans, etc. I just think that's pretty cool. But yeah, I've got- Yeah, it's YouTube. It's YouTube, John. That's how YouTube works. All of these responses from people, I've had people come up to me at events with tears in their eyes talking to me about how this issue has affected them. And there's a few reasons that I say this. Firstly, because it's indicative that we're heading in the right direction, that we've identified a serious- We've taken vulnerable people who actually suffer from an addiction to pornography, uh, and we've used that to funnel them into the alt-right. Hooray, we've done a great job. It's always good to take advantage of vulnerable people, John. You're nailing it. Problem, and we're helping people solve it. That is obviously very important, despite the fact that it receives practically no attention. And secondly, so that if you're struggling with this, which frankly you probably are, you know that you're not alone and that there's no shame in this at all. A lot of times people on the right have this attitude of, well, you're on your own, bucko. Pull yourself up by your bootstraps. Your problems are my problems, snowflake. Sure, there's truth to that. Ultimately, you're responsible for yourself. But that aside, there's nothing conservative about not caring about people or not helping them. Every other conservative disagrees with you, John. <laughs> I've never seen a conservative ever really give a shit about another person who has nothing to do with them. Conservatism properly defined is that which conserves the traditional American society. And that actually requires helping and caring about your neighbors, your family. Your the problem is it's not conservative anymore, John. You don't want to conserve where society is. You want to retreat back to a fantasy 1950s leave it to beaver fake land where everyone just gets along and the milkman comes and your wife stays at home and cooks you a pot roast 
a world that never really existed the way that you people imagine it to be. You're not conservatives. You're not conserving anything. You're regressives. You want to go back into a really bad period of history for the vast majority of people in the country. If you weren't a straight white dude back then, you were having a pretty bad time. <sighs> John doesn't care, though, and I understand that, but, you know, it's good to point out that he's a piece of shit community, etc. So I will reiterate that there's no shame in pornography addiction, especially considering that what it is is quite literally a hijacking of your biological wiring as a man in order to neuroplastically rewire your brain into addiction, all for their profit and ultimately for the destruction of our society. The people run That was a lot of words to say uh, your pleasure centers get triggered by pornography and you can become addicted to that and capitalism incentivizing people to get into that and want that reward time after time after time again. Yeah? Running things have hijacked and exploited our biological drives to pursue food and sex to where we're now fat and addicted to pornography. And that's made us weak. They've made a lot of money doing that. And as we'll get into, the reasons that drugs such as methamphetamine and heroin are so powerfully addictive is that they hijack the precise mechanisms that are designed to regulate sex in the reward center of our brain. In other words, the reason that drugs are so addicting is because they hijack the mechanisms in your brain that are used to regulate sexual desire and co-op them to compel you to crave more of that particular drug. So are you literally just describing the pleasure centers of the brain as sex drive centers? Because that's not really a complete picture. Obviously, pleasure centers have a role in sex, like releasing dopamine and all sorts of other chemicals like that. But they're not purely for sex. Like, I can, I can, I don't know, what's a good example? Have a nice meal and have pleasure centers, you know, tell me, oh, this is a good thing. I like this. I could watch a TV show I really like and have the same thing or read a good book. Like, your pleasure centers aren't just sex centers of your brain. It's pretty disingenuous to frame it like that. Technically speaking, on a biological level, drugs are addictive because they exploit your sex drive, so to speak. So you can understand the cognitive implications of this. Pornography is something that will also exploit your sex drive more understandably because it exists as something that is an unnaturally exaggerated version of something that you are programmed to find irresistible. These are called supernormal stimuli, which comes from renowned biologist Nicholas Timbergen, who was also a Nobel laureate. And then it is made available to you conveniently and in limitless supply, something that you would never find in nature. There is abundant novelty to what types you can access. And this all causes us to chronically overconsume and resultantly reconfigure our brains to try their best to adapt to this as we become addicted. Drugs are dangerous because they exploit the mechanisms in your brain that exist to regulate your sex drive, and this is incredibly addicting. And then the same thing happens when you have pornography in the way that we do now. It does practically the same thing to your brain. And we'll go through this step by step, but this is why even heroin addicts will tell you that shooting up feels like an orgasm if, when you talk to one. I don't know your circle. Um, and this is also why the brain scans of drug addicts are very similar to the brain scans of pornography users, but not addicts. That's what they'll say. But the truth is that there are basically two types of pornography users, those who will become addicted and those who already are addicted. And then within the latter category, you have those who know. <laughs> so everyone who ever uses porn whether it's uh, uh, someone who uses porn once a week or once a month or once every two weeks, they're a porn addict? What are you talking about? This would be like me saying everyone from someone who has a one beer once a month or something and comparing them with someone who drinks a fifth of vodka a day. These are not equivalent things, John. There are people, I would argue most people who engage with adult content online or elsewhere, do so in a healthy way. Why are you saying that anyone who engages with this stuff is automatically addicted? What are you talking about? Those are addicted and those who don't know or perhaps refuse to accept that they're addicted. And we'll you know, get into that, the neurochemistry behind that shortly to explain kind of what's going on in your brain. But I say this now to really just emphasize that- Does John think animals don't masturbate? Because the way he's just talking about that, this makes it sound like he thinks animals and even things that are the closest related to us, like chimps or bonobos. Does he think these animals in the absence of porn don't touch themselves and pleasure themselves? Because animals do that. Humans do that. It's a normal thing that animals do, at least mammals, because of how our sex drives tend to work. It's not out there for animals to do that. It's normal. 
There's no shame in pornography addiction because your brain is just simply not capable of handling that level of stimuli. Now, that being said, there is great shame in evangelically pretending that it doesn't exist. The so-called experts, the sex-positive experts, these are people who say things like, um, this claim has been debunked. Um, this study says otherwise. And we'll address the most popular arguments from these people at the end. Again, by the way, his rebuttal to people telling him that these sources are saying he's wrong is this image. <laughs> Here are sources that say you wrong. Oh, but have you considered I put a picture on the screen of the meme man doing a cry? Checkmate, leftists. <laughs> Maybe that is John Doyle and it's just cum coming out of his eyeballs because he's so backed up. <laughs> his eyes are red because they're full of cum. I have anecdotes that can be corroborated thousands of times over online from people who have experienced this stuff. Thousands of people on internet said a thing. Wow. What a great sample size considering the internet has hundreds of millions to billions of active members. But I also have lots of data to back up what we're talking about here. But for now, what I'll say is this. I don't listen to degenerates. I just don't. And the reason for that is very simple. And it's that... Wait, you hang out with Nick Fuentes all the time and he, he did it with a cat boy. What are you talking about? As human beings in the pursuit of virtue and truth, we can only reach the truth if we conquer and have total control over our desires. Otherwise, we will view everything through the lens of our desires since we do not have control over them, but rather they have control over us. And given that sexual desire is the most powerful desire that we have as human beings, I refuse to listen to degenerate people argue in favor of degenerate things. Because what is very likely happening is that... Don't you love when Nazis just straight up use, like, Nazi terminology and start calling people dirty degenerates and stuff? Makes my job so much easier. I don't have to make any funny jokes. I just get to point at the thing and be like, yeah, you know, mm. he's saying the thing. He's saying the thing out loud. Is that they have a proclivity towards whatever aids in or alleviates the guilt from that desire, and that ultimately distorts the truth. You wouldn't listen to a heroin addict talk about why heroin isn't actually a bad thing. You shouldn't listen to a porn addict argue the same. They're the problem is that you've presuppositionally decided that any single person who engages with pornography at any level at any rate is an addict that's the problem you've painted anyone who uses porn with a, br a brush so broadly that the definition of addict means absolutely nothing at this point it just means a person who uses porn even semi-regularly that's ridiculous like, imagine if I tried to do the same thing, John. Imagine if I made a video that was an hour 40 minutes long on how guns are terrible and destroying the country, which I don't necessarily believe, by the way. I'm fine with gun ownership, but I am in favor of, like, reasonable restrictions on certain things. Um, but either way, imagine I made a video that's like, guns are destroying the country, and then someone who actually has knowledge of guns, because I don't, and I don't claim to have, like, a, a vast knowledge of firearms, comes to me and says, actually, you know, here are things that I think are good about guns. Here are technical aspects that you don't understand about guns. And I went, I'm not going to listen to a gun addict tell me about guns. And then they're like, what are you talking about? I don't even own that many guns. I just, every once in a while, once a month, I go to the shooting range, and I enjoy doing it, and I want it for home protection. And I go... Anyone who has a gun or ever engages with a gun is a gun addict. I'd get called a dipshit. I'd be called a, a ridiculous because that's a terrible argument. <laughs> ...by their desires, and they are rationalizing it. This is the part where the irrelevant streamer pauses the video and says... <laughs> Um, is John Doyle really comparing heroin addiction to pornography addiction? All the only couple thousand viewers watch me pretend to stare blankly at the screen before looking at the camera like Jim from The Office. No, I'm not actually comparing the effects of heroin to the... It's <laughs> a good impression. Both of me and Jake. ...effects of pornography because the effects of pornography have far worse implications on our society. We'll get into that. But even... Did he just say porn is worse for society than heroin addiction? Oh, John. That in itself proves my point because there's this subculture of these really gross and vulgar leftists who exist online to let me live in their head rent free. They do these group That's therapy true. sessions where the fattest and the grossest one tries to bully me, which is impossible, by the way, because you can't bully me. You just can't. Oh, no! I think he's really mad at Jake. <laughs> or me too, which is possible. That's fine. Love you too, John. I'm too epic. 
you're an addict. You're, you're literally an addict who's coping. And they're so corrupted by their desires that they simply can't imagine living without that. I'm going to be real. I know Jake pretty well. I don't think he looks at porn that often. He might sometimes, but not that often. He does bang on the reg, though. That dude has a libido that is off the charts. Like, he's, 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 he's engaging in sexual activity with his girlfriend all the goddamn time, okay? And that's great. I'm happy for them. Uh, I find it weird that you, you're calling Jake like a porn addict, though, because I don't think he engages with porn often. He doesn't feel the need to. <sighs> Occupying their consciousness because they're... He said as much yesterday? Yeah, sounds about right slave and so they'll say stuff because i'm a proponent of sexual morality i detest hookup culture and so they'll say john doyle's just mad because girls don't like him he needs to get laid and you look at these guys i do think you should get laid but i don't think that's why you met you're mad i don't i think you're mad for a lot of different reasons i think your sexual frustration isn't helping and that's certainly a thing but no i think it more has to do with the way you were raised by your parents the fact that you're a religious fundamentalist, that's not helping. I imagine you feel a lot of shame around sex. I don't know. It's not healthy, but I don't think that's why you're mad. Guys, like, really? You and I go out to a bar or something, you think girls are going to be coming up to me like, oh my god, who's your friend over there? No, no, you're coping. Like, maybe, man to man, maybe you're picking up girls that are like high threes at best. You think you're winning somehow? Actually, I kind of feel bad for these guys because it's like, it's one thing if you're a good looking guy, you're charismatic, you decide to exploit that to go hook up with a bunch of attractive girls. I still think that's wrong, but like, I can understand that. Whereas these guys are hooking up with like these gross, overweight feminist types. And it's like, it can't be because you think they're hot. So it's just because you are so addicted to lust that you are willing to resort <laughs> to hooking up with girls that look like defective Pokemon to fulfill that desire. I just- Jesus Christ, John. <laughs> Oh my god! How does he still have a channel? He's so awful! <laughs> oh. Can't respect that. You have no self control. That's why you're fat. That's why you hook up with gross women. You have group therapy sessions during which you and your other degenerates all get together and try to bully me because it makes you feel less guilty about your behavior and lifestyle and it makes you feel less threatened by me and the boys. So don't care. Didn't ask. Pl <laughs> John has not been having a good time since Trump lost the election, has he? Everything is going downhill for him. He is freaking out. <laughs> Plus, you're an addict. You don't like me. You don't like my audience. You don't like America. You don't like Jesus because we're all epic and you're not and you're insecure about it. But it's okay. We're going to try to help you out too because at the end of the day, we still care about you. So let's jump into it. We have data, but keep in mind this problem is becoming so accelerated and widespread that we're not going to be able to wait a few decades to decide that it's terrible in the way that we did with cigarettes. We have to actually act quickly. And so, you know, one of the he thinks porn is more dangerous than cigarettes. Oh, John. John really wants to. You think John ever watches The Handmaid's Tale as aspirational viewing material? He must have seen it at this point, right? Does he want to be, like, mayor of a town in Gleed? He could have, like, a little cabal of, of uh, a little harem of handmaids or whatever. One of the first things we mentioned was that 98% of men have accessed pornography within the last six months, 80% just within the last week. For reference, that means that statistically four out of the last five guys that you've spoken to are watching pornography at least once a week. That yeah, I think that's pretty common. That's where we're at now, roughly speaking. Let's talk about where we were. We used to be like a decade ago. We're focusing on guys younger than 30, by the way, since our brains have been the most harmed by this since they caught us when our brains were the most plastic. So in 2008, the percentage of boys who had been exposed to pornography before they were 13 was 14.4%. In 2011, it jumped to 48.7%. I don't believe that stat at all. <laughs> no offense. But uh, I would absolutely agree that it's probably gone up since the advent of the internet. But the internet was a thing a decade ago, right? The internet was still a thing. I don't believe that poll. I don't believe that poll even a little bit. In 2017, there was a study done on people ages 15 to 29 that found that 69% of males had been exposed to porn nice. pornography at age 13 or younger. And also that virtually all of the men by this point had viewed pornography at some point. So the average age at which boys are exposed to pornography is decreased. Why is it just boys too? Does he know people who aren't men look at porn? I'm not even necessarily talking about me because I know John doesn't like trans people, but like, 
everyone I've dated in my life, and I've only ever dated women, have also looked at porn. Maybe John doesn't know that, because John, I don't know if he's ever had a girlfriend. And if he has, I doubt it's, you know, someone who's going to be open about sex stuff. But, like, <laughs> I've never dated someone who doesn't watch porn. Increasing each year, but it's widely regarded to be 11 years old, which means that if we assume a normal distribution, 50% of boys are exposed to pornography when or before they are 11 years old. To help you realize how utterly insane and dangerous that is, here is a stock photo of an 11 year old boy. Another thing to note is that of online pornography consumption done by minors, fully 22% of that is done by children younger than 10. That's almost a quarter of it. In 2008, the percentage of adolescents who viewed pornography every day was 5.2%. By 2011, it was over 13%. Okay, and if you want to do something about that, that's fine. If you want to put some sort of tougher regulations on how porn is accessed on the internet. Like, obviously, right now, it's basically a system where you, I don't know, put in, you know, you just say, oh, yes, I'm 18 or whatever. Uh... Otherwise, that, that's it. And anyone can click that. If you wanted to figure out some way that's more secure, that would be okay. I wouldn't have a problem with that. Because I can understand not wanting your kids to, to watch porn, you know? Um, however, I do think if you're like 16, 17, I don't know. Is it not normal for 16 and 17 year olds to watch porn? John, of course, is going to say no. But like... <laughs> Do you think, again, historically, that 16 and 17-year-olds don't jerk off? This seems a little odd. 2017, 39% of males between 15 and 29 viewed it daily. So the trend suggests that each year more people are watching it more often and at a younger age. And there was I would guess. Sorry, give me a sec. If I had to guess, I would think also the self-reporting rates have probably gone up just because as a society we've continued to get more open and honest and understanding about sexuality being like a natural thing so i think in the past people probably would have been a little bit more ashamed to admit oh i watch porn or i watch porn at this age or whatever whereas nowadays i think people are like yeah sure watched all sorts of porn whatever there's nothing to suggest that the trends are going to reverse or halt themselves. That's not good. And the problem that we have isn't exactly pornography in general. Like there was a time in this country when the best case scenario, especially for young men, was like the Sears catalog, maybe a Playboy that you paid way too much for and then buried in your closet. But we have to understand that what we're dealing with now is- John, do you understand that Playboy and Penthouse have existed for quite a while? And even before then, you could go and get raunchy material. There were adult bookstores long before those. Tremendously different than that. And it is something that we've never had in the history of the world, let alone the history of our society. And for the last decade or so, we have been witnessing the effects of it. And a lot of people might think that I'm just like out of touch or something. You are. You're also historically illiterate to think that people haven't had access to porn previously. Like every time a new technology comes into existence, whether it's the advent of the moving picture or the novel, or the printing press. You know what that shit gets used for? Making smut. People love smut. We're monkeys. You know what monkeys like to do? They like to jack off. <laughs> Don't get me wrong, like, if I had a son and my wife was like, I caught our son and his friends looking at a crumpled Polaroid photograph of a boob behind the garage, I would just laugh. I really wouldn't care. Women just tend to feel negatively about this type of stuff as a general rule. <laughs> I'm glad John's here to speak for all women. They're not exactly wrong in that. We'll come back to that later. But the point is that you had magazines, maybe pictures, still images. And then you had a finite amount. Then maybe you had some X-rated movies, but you still have to go to adult bookstores to watch clips, those weird theaters that play them. Not exactly a comfortable experience. Then maybe, you know, you've got VHS tapes. Then you actually have to go get VHS tapes. You have to buy it. It's a weird experience. You have to watch it. You can't just, like, skip around. You can only watch one at a time unless you have multiple televisions with multiple VHS players or the late-night cable channels. But even then, you actually have to watch the whole thing. You can't skip around. Maybe you can, like, watch other channels. But still, as a general rule you had to jump over hurdles to access pornography and even then it wasn't as good per se as what we're dealing with now then we had dial up which was cheaper less expensive yet more privacy but it was still mostly just pictures they would take forever to load you couldn't just consume at a click and if you wanted videos you'd have to download stuff but you know maybe you don't have the right software then you're risking getting a virus. It was still a relatively complicated process. Then 2006 happened, high-speed internet exploded, and everything got bad. That's when you started getting tube sites that had videos like YouTube, except it's pornography. Nothing else was happening in America post, let's just pick a random date. 
I don't know, what's a random date pre-2006? Let's say the 11th of September, 2001. Nothing else in the country has happened uh, past that random date that uh, has affected anything in terms of the direction the country has gone. It's entirely because people started masturbating to pornography on the internet. <laughs> and society basically... Did you know that jerking off literally created the Patriot Act? Literally. George W. Bush jerked off onto a piece of paper and it just literally wrote out the Patriot Act in its entirety. Crazy stuff. Really teed itself up to collapse. And here we are about 15 years later dealing with the consequences of that. High speed internet and its consequences have been a disaster for the human race. But yeah, kind of a weird timeline to go through, I guess. But Says a guy who is literally making his entire living pushing right wing propaganda using high-speed internet the irony i i can't it's important to what we're about to get into with the addiction component because it is because of this evolution that it has become so pervasive in our society and so incredibly addictive it's not clear to me at all that something like this could have ever happened with the sears catalogs or the playboys that we mentioned earlier let alone to this degree of addiction let alone to this degree of pervasiveness and let alone to this degree of exposure to our children who really end up suffering the most in terms of how it damages their brain but also in terms of how it damages their family and the society that they'll have to grow up in and live in for the rest of their lives like it's one thing if you're a 50-year-old guy who discovers online pornography in 2009, but to be exposed to this as a child while your brain is developing, your entire generation is in the same boat, all the men in your life are watching it, even if they're not as negatively affected as you are. Like, no one wants to have this conversation. It's a big problem, and, and this isn't... People talk about porn addiction. Porn addiction is a thing. I think that even came up, like, in my sex ed at school. That was a thing that was discussed. Like, it's okay to watch porn, but hey, there are limits, and just like anything, they even went over the whole, like, like anything, your brain can become addicted to things that cause you pleasure. Uh, Lifetime d did a whole shitty Lifetime movie on this. I think it was called, like, Cyber Seduction or something? It's actually a very funny movie. If you like bad movies, it's pretty good. Um, <laughs> but anyway... The point is, this is a problem that gets talked to with kids. As long as you're open with your kids about this stuff, yeah, people talk to them. Also, as a parent, I'd argue that's your responsibility, too. Like, telling your kids, hey, it's natural to, like, and again, John's going to disagree with this, but I think it's reasonable as a parent to talk to your kids once they're old enough and be like, hey, this is the thing. Um, if, if you're going to do it, that's your business. That's fine. Just make sure you're, you know, respecting other people's boundaries and doing it privately because other people don't want to be involved in, in that. Um, uh, and do so, you know, in a reasonable amount. I don't know. <laughs> I'm not a parent, as you can tell. Either way, my point is, uh, yeah, John's, John's pretty out of touch on this one. Uh, Antipodian Squid with 2,500 bits says celebratory pride biddies for one of the best trans influences on the internet because I was brave and got myself some trans NB healthcare today. Ooh, good for you. Good job. I'm glad. I'm glad you're going to be covered. Even taking into account the gateway to pornography for your children that is social media, Snapchat, Instagram, TikTok especially, it's all terrible. If you're a parent, download the apps, look around for 10 minutes. You'll see exactly what I mean. And also what your kid is looking at every day. But anyways. What someone think of the children? This is the part where we get into the nature of pornography addiction. So fasten your seatbelt. Some of this stuff is pretty dense, but we'll do our best, right? So first we have to summarize basically what pornography does to your brain in terms of addiction. We'll start at the very tip of the iceberg. So first, know that pornography does measurable damage to various parts of your prefrontal cortex. The good news is that this damage has been shown to be impermanent if the addiction is broken, but the bad news is that it makes it incredibly difficult to break and even acknowledge the reality of the addiction. For example, the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, which is associated with self discipline self-control and compulsivity will lose tissue and cause you to be more compulsive with your decision making the ventrolateral prefrontal cortex which is associated with self-monitoring of behavior will also lose tissue and cause you to have impaired self-monitoring which basically means that you'll be less aware of what you're doing which will make you less able to hold yourself accountable and behave properly the medial prefrontal cortex which is associated with your awareness of your physical and emotional state will also lose tissue and cause you to be more likely to be in a state of denial about your problem and to instead prioritize pursuing your addiction and also 
your ventromedial prefrontal cortex, which is associated with motivating you to pursue that which is beneficial to you, will be damaged as well and cause you to be instead motivated to pursue your addiction. So that I know he already made fun of the idea of asking for sources because apparently he was too lazy to provide any sources in his, you know, description or anything. But yeah, I'm going to have to say source. I'm not even necessarily disagreeing. I would imagine someone who is actually addicted to porn would probably have these problems. But again, if you're going to claim that like everyone who engaged with pornography in any way, shape, or form has these issues to the level that they're actually detrimental to their day-to-day -day life, that probably needs a source. You at least need to say, according to, even if you don't like provide an actual link in the description, you should say, According to such and such journal, according to such and such medical text, according to this website that I looked at, whatever the website was. That's very important to note. And moving on, we get into the fact that basically you're classified as a mammal. And technically speaking, rats are also mammals. But since we're on Team Human, we don't want to do potentially unethical testing on ourselves. So instead, we do a lot of testing on rats because they spawn quickly. They're inexpensive. They're easy to house. Most importantly, though, they're very closely related to us in terms of biological and genetic makeup. And for that reason, you can replicate a lot of symptoms of the human condition in rats. And there's something observed in rats, but also in many other mammals, that has been called the Chris Sia with 100 Bit says the study he's citing did not establish a causal link. It studied porn addicts, but did not know if these were natural naturally smaller. Ah, so they don't know if it was a chicken or egg thing. Were people with these areas of the brain that function differently more susceptible to becoming porn addicts or did the porn addiction cause these issues? Gotcha. The Coolidge effect, and it is an example of how continuous sexual novelty can drive the behavior of mammals. So if you take a male rat, put him in a cage with a female rat, he's going to assert himself because rats don't have a me too movement and he will continue to really <laughs> that's the joke we're going with jesus christ assert himself until haha -ha, isn't it funny because rats can just fuck each other haha -ha, isn't isn't rape funny i'm not saying the rat is doing that to so i'm saying the human equivalent would be that john you fucking ass he gets bored and even you know if the female rat is like what are we he, he'll just be done he'll be totally bored with her doesn't want anything to do with her, but then if you throw in a different female rat, he will reassert himself with her until he gets bored again. You can literally repeat this process with new female rats until the male rat collapses from exhaustion. This is because his top genetic priority is reproduction, and new female rats allow him to do that. Now, of course, human beings are a bit more sophisticated than rats. We actually have a Me Too movement. Our mating process is more complex, and we're part of the about 5%. John, if your joke is predicated on why can't I just do anyone at any time without their consent, probably edit that joke out percent of mammals with the capacity for long-term bonds but our brains are still affected by the coolidge effect which gets its name from president calvin coolidge based and the story goes that he was touring a farm with his wife and the farmer showed his wife a rooster that spent all day every day mating with hens and his wife supposedly said tell that to mr coolidge and so the farmer did and then coolidge responded by asking if it was with the same hen the farmer said no and he replied tell that to mrs coolidge pretty epic joke women take the l yet again but anyways the takeaway is that continuous sexual novelty tends to drive the behavior of mammals with the idea being that your best case scenario for continuing the bloodline is if every female is pregnant. Now, young man, this desire that you have to get every female pregnant arises largely from a chemical called dopamine. And dopamine amps up the centerpiece of a very primitive part of your brain known as the reward circuitry, which is where you get your cravings and your pleasure, but also your addictions. This part of your brain is what makes you want to do the things that keep you alive and get women pregnant, basically. <laughs> as a human, your list of priorities are like food, sex, love, friendship, novelty. These are called natural rewards, and they are different from addictive chemicals. But the problem is that addictive chemicals can hijack the same circuitry in your brain as we talked about earlier. So the whole reason that you have dopamine is to motivate you to do whatever serves those interests, basically. Lots of dopamine when you eat candy, not a whole lot when you eat cauliflower. That's just the way it works. It tells you where to direct your attention and what to pursue. And it also helps you remember those things by rewiring your brain via new or stronger nerve connections. And sexual stimulation and orgasm add up to the biggest natural release of dopamine and opioids available to your reward circuitry. So you can start to see why we need to be careful. Because a lot of people describe dopamine as the pleasure chemical. That's not actually accurate because it's much more about seeking and searching for that pleasure, not the pleasure in itself.
as you get closer, your dopamine rises with anticipation, and it motivates you to keep going towards whatever you want. Sure, but there are different chemicals. Serotonin and stuff gets released when you actually achieve whatever goal you're going towards. That's immediate pleasure, a long-term goal, and it does this by attaching to receptors in your brain to stimulate electrical impulses. What you end up feeling is the actual pleasure is the release of the opioids, um, which also bind to the receptors in the reward circuitry of your brain. So dopamine compels you to find water, and then opioids are the relief feeling that you get upon quenching your thirst. Dopamine is what makes you want to get the feeling female pregnant opioids are the feeling that you get upon doing so you get the point dopamine makes you want stuff opioids make you like stuff but the problem with that is that they aren't so easily separated in our brains so dopamine causes us to desire and seek things but dopamine is also a stronger system than our opioid system which means that we're always seeking more than we are satisfied and the reason for that is that seeking and desiring is more likely to keep us alive than just sitting around satiated satisfied in a daze doing nothing but the problem is that this imbalance, when overstimulated, leads ultimately to addiction because the desires and the cravings increase while the pleasure you get decreases. So you want something more and more, but you don't like it as much as you used to, so you compensate by craving more of it, and the cycle continues. Another thing that we mentioned earlier that plays a big role here is novelty. That's the Coolidge effect. Dopamine surges for novelty. Without novelty, it diminishes over time. They've done studies where they'll show a group of men part of an X-rated movie and measure their dopamine, and it gets lower every time they play it back, and then they play part of a different one, and it shoots right back up. Up. And it's also true that men will ejaculate faster in greater volume and with faster sperm when viewing a new naked girl pretty as opposed to the same one. So basically your brain can't tell the difference between watching pornography and having sex. And so in the span of a shameful afternoon with a few extra tabs open, you can have more sexual partners according to your brain than your ancestors would have had in their entire lives. And if you think... Yeah, that's true. The same thing applies to a lot of the other stuff in our lives. Today, I can open a tab on the internet and go read more news than anyone, like, more information on the world than people in previous generations would have ever had access to easily. I can do the same thing with the number of movies I have access to and the number of books and stuff. That's sort of how it is in the future. We have access to all sorts of stuff. It just depends on what you do with that. Again, porn addiction is a real thing that people have, and it's serious, but to imply just because people have access to a huge amount of pornography that they are inherently addicted regardless of the amount of it that they actually what's the word in take in use watch whatever i don't know it just seems stupid it implies that like anyone who plays video games is automatically addicted to video games because there's more available today than there ever have been or if you watch movies you're addicted to movies because they're more easily available than ever it's not really how that works. I think your brain has the hardware to handle this. You are mistaken. This gets back into the supernormal stimuli that we touched on earlier because it's not just the endless novelty that makes this so bad, but also the adjacent emotions and stimuli as well. Since dopamine also fires up for things like surprise or shock factor, violations of your expectations, you never thought you'd see something like this, anxiety, maybe this goes against your values or even your sexuality, also generally searching and seeking things out. All of those things, of course, are rampant in pornography, and many of them not only elevate dopamine, like anxiety, shock, surprise, shame, etc., but they also boost your stress hormones and neurotransmitters, and that ends up increasing your excitement and amplifying the effects of the dopamine. And over time, I kid you not, your brain can start to confuse feelings of anxiety or riskiness with feelings of sexual arousal. And this explains why pornography addicts often escalate into watching more extreme and more shocking content, because they need that extra neurochemical boost. It also explains why if you've ever felt suddenly stressed out by something, and your first instinct is to watch pornography, you're like, what the hell? It's because you built that association. What? What? <laughs> I've never had that happen to me. Again, John is probably describing an actual thing that happens to real porn addicts. But porn addicts are not the majority of people who watch porn. Why are you acting like they are, John? In, in your brain. The common phrase is neurons that fire together wire together. And if you amplify the effects of the dopamine with these neurochemicals, then what's going to happen is that. And then when something totally random happens to you that stresses you out, has nothing to do with that, you'll feel compelled to watch pornography because you've rewired your brain, literally. Your brain will have confused anxiety or riskiness for sexual arousal. Speaking of stress, there's this myth that pornography is good because it relieves stress. First of all, you have to laugh at the utter state of the coon brain. Like, yeah, dude, that's why you're watching porn 10 times a week. You're just stressed out. It's like, no, go for a run, take a bath, do something else. Like, at least be honest with yourself that watching pornography to relieve stress is just you trying to justify your addiction. And that aside, it doesn't actually relieve stress because as we'll get into, it literally rewires your brain 
brain to make you more miserable. So even if you can achieve that temporary relief, it will soon go away. And your baseline levels of stress and general despair are going to be much higher if you're using pornography. And I have to stress this point again, which is that given the incredibly addictive nature of pornography and how widespread that addiction is in our society, it's not only possible, but probable that anyone arguing its benefits is only trying to justify their addiction. It really <laughs> It's easy to win arguments when you just decide that anyone who disagrees with you is automatically invalid in their opinions because you've classified them as an addict and therefore their opinion doesn't matter. It is that simple. I would never listen to a cigarette addict tell me that cigarettes are good, or at the very least not bad, the same way that I would never listen to a pornography addict tell me that their addiction is the same, like their judgment is clouded by the addiction. Their prefrontal cortex has been damaged and compromised. We just went over the details of that. But back to the supernormal stimulus. It's a concept we discussed earlier. Basically, the danger lies when you have something that is registered in our brains as especially valuable to us, something that is an artificially exaggerated version of something that our brains are wired to find irresistible, and then that is available conveniently in limitless supply, which could never be found in nature, and it comes in limitless varieties. That's the novelty we talked about earlier. And as a result of these things, we're chronically overconsuming it. None of this applies, and, and Baja made a good point too. Baja said, if I, where did it go? Something along the lines of, if I sleep with my girlfriend every week, does that mean I'm addicted to her? Everything he's saying, because he's comparing this stro so strongly to, like, actual interpersonal sexual activity and saying that it's hijacking those same systems, would this not apply to regular sexuality as well? That wouldn't just be a porn thing, then. The same exact thing would apply to human people in real life. John, when you get married and you have sex with your wife... Are you addicted to your wife because you sleep with your wife regularly? Are you going to feel the need to escalate that because it's just not enough anymore? Doesn't really make sense when you apply it backwards the way that you were trying to push it forwards by comparing porn addiction to how your brain treats other things. Just seems weird. There are two components in our society that first come to mind when talking about this. Uh, first one is junk food and then pornography. Junk food is already recognized to be a supernormal stimulus. Uh, you know, we're all fat and gross as a result of it. I am. And there's an argument to be made that the government subsidizes junk food so that we're all too fat and lazy to do something about it. I, of course, I would never make that argument the same way that I would never make the argument that the government enables widespread pornography access in order to keep us depressed, pacified, and distracted <laughs> because I... Oh, no, he's doing the thing where he says... He says he doesn't think the thing, but he actually thinks the thing. Does John think the agricultural subsidies to corn farmers? And I don't even understand how he thinks the government is helping people get porn. We're not subsidizing Pornhub as far as I know. So how does he think that's working? You think the government is sending me Pornhub links to try and keep me subservient? It's not working too well. Not a big fan of Joe Biden. Anyway. I know that the government always has my best interest at heart. I live in Michigan. Are you kidding me? The point is that pornography is actually a more potent supernormal stimulus than junk food is simply because of its nature. Namely, the fact that it costs less, can be accessed with a few clicks at any time from practically anywhere. There's no precise physical limits on its consumption. Whereas you have to eventually stop eating because your stomach has a capacity. You can just keep watching pornography. Oh, John. No, you cannot keep watching pornography indefinitely. For one thing... Oh, God, I can tell John isn't... <laughs> John, there are physical limits as well for people with, with, with testicles and, and penises. There are physical limits there as well for a variety of different reasons. Let's put it that way, shall we? ...until you, like, pass out or something. This is where we get back into the parallels to drug addiction. And also the rats, because we actually have research that shows that... Yeah, you'd get sore. Oh my God, I think. Amphetamine and cocaine hijack the same reward center nerve cells that evolved for sexual conditioning. And some of these studies have shown that sex to completion shrinks the cells that pump dopamine through the reward circuit. And also that those dopamine producing nerve cells shrink with heroin addiction. So what is Again, everything you're saying here would apply to regular sex as well with your wife. 
does that mean? Well, the reason that drugs like methamphetamine and heroin are compelling is that they hijack the precise mechanisms in our brain that are designed for sex. So while it's true that there are other pleasures that activate the reward center of our brain, the fact is that the nerve cells don't overlap nearly as closely as they do with sex, which is why non-sexual natural rewards feel different and less compelling. So sex is the most compelling given the hardware of our brain, and drugs are incredibly compelling because they hijack that hardware and overload it, basically. And so sexual arousal and orgasm induce higher levels of dopamine and opioids than any other natural reward, but there are other components below our conscious awareness that play a role as well. For example, uh, there's a protein that accumulates through sex and drug use called delta Fos b and it activates genes involved with addiction, and the molecular changes that it generates are nearly identical for both sexual conditioning and chronic use of drugs. So regardless of what you're abusing, high levels of delta Fos b accumulate and rewire the brain to pursue more of that thing, which is how addictive drugs co-opt the learning mechanisms um, in our brain that are designed to make us pursue sexual activity. And by the way, this is related to why if you look at brain scans of drug addicts compared to brain scans of pornography users, but not addicts, they're practically identical. But anyways, the climax of that sexual activity causes lots of temporary neurological and hormonal changes to occur, upon which I don't really care to elaborate since the political implications from the neurochemistry of the orgasm, heck off commie, is something that I was really looking forward to covering at a later <laughs> time. That's the highbrow content that the people want. But we do know that these changes do not occur with any other natural rewards, and we know that this is done by our brain so that we know the difference between sexual activity and drinking a milkshake. But we also know that dopamine plays a very significant role in this. And we'll actually just debunk this right now because there's this common argument about pornography addiction and dopamine, and it's literally, well, lots of different things raise your dopamine levels, so there's no difference between watching pornography and watching a sunset. And we actually tested that. I've literally never heard anyone make that argument in regard to like actual pornography addiction. There are absolutely people with pornography addictions. A theory about 20 years ago, and it turns out that it's total BS. Uh, we did a study with brain scans, and it found that cocaine addicts had nearly identical brain patterns when viewing images of pornography and images of crack pipes, and also that everyone had the same brain activation patterns for viewing pornography, so connect the dots there. And finally, that the patterns were completely different for looking at sunsets. The point being that drugs and sex can activate the sex neurons in your brain without actual sex, and sunsets can't, you idiot. It is obvious that our most powerful natural reinforcer is orgasm, which means that there is no neurological equivalent to streaming and masturbating to pornography. You can do drugs, you can drink, you can play video games, you can do whatever you want to elevate your dopamine, but none of that will have the power to sculpt your sexual brain circuitry the way that pornography does, especially... Sean's not aware of the visual novel genre or the dating sim, apparently, if he thinks that sex and video games have nothing to do with each other. <laughs> what do you think John's Steam account looks like? If you're watching it at a young age when your brain is the most plastic and susceptible to that, and this is where it starts to get kind of dangerous because you have to take into account the binge mechanism that is programmed into your brain for what your brain perceives will help your survival, things like food and sex. And whenever you binge things like food and sex, your brain thinks that you've hit the jackpot and it neurochemically reacts to incentivize you to keep going. Like it literally overrides any instinct to stop because you're full or because you've had enough. So this being the case, you can understand the problem that we've created in the last 15 years where your brain thinks that internet pornography has provided to it conceivably endless mating opportunities so to speak as long as you have an internet connection you can go forever and you'll never consume all the available content and your brain was not designed nor is it prepared to handle that kind of non-stop stimulation so i would argue that you could argue the same thing redundant i would argue that you could say the same thing about access to food today as how do i put this access to food today as compared to like i don't know the 1800s. I have more access to food than the vast majority of my ancestors. So if I get hungry, I go and eat. Now, I have disordered eating, so I eat even if I'm not hungry, which isn't good. And certainly a lot of Americans do have problems with overindulging in terms of caloric intake. I would completely agree with that. And I'm sure the number of people who are engaging in self-pleasure activity, let's say, might be at a higher rate today than it was in the past uh, due to access to materials like pornography. But the difference being something like eating a bunch of pizza or eating anything that's unhealthy for you, that has like physical detriments to the body. And again, the sources that, not even sources, the claims that John has been making about the effects on the brain don't appear to be very substantiated in terms of like, normal people viewing porn on a regular basis and not people who are actively 
addicted to pornography. Of course, he thinks the groups are one and the same, but they're really not. And I think the vast majority of people in the world recognize that distinction. What does it do? What does the brain, particularly the young male brain, do when it has unlimited access to a super stimulating reward that it never evolved to handle? It tends to adapt, but not in a good way. Remember what we just talked about with the substance or chemical addictions? How it restructures the brain works the same way with behavioral addictions. We just covered how sexual arousal and addictive drugs like meth and cocaine stimulate the same group of reward system nerve cells while triggering the same mechanisms in your brain that make you crave more. And so given that, it's not surprising that sexual conditioning through pornography and drug use involve the same general brain changes, which are changes involving sensitization. And this is where it starts to get really interesting. Basically, the neurochemical events that create sensitization are caused by spikes of dopamine dopamine, but the actual thing in your brain that produces it is our friend from earlier, that protein uh, delta phos B. And essentially what happens is that dopamine surges trigger the production of delta phos B, and it then slowly accumulates in the reward circuitry of your brain in proportion to the amount of dopamine that you release when you chronically indulge in your natural reward of choice, sex, junk food, those drugs that we mentioned earlier, whatever. And the protein delta phos B is referred to as a transcription factor because it activates a very specific set of genes to physically and chemically alter the reward circuitry of your brain in order to chase that dopamine. It essentially reacts to the behavior that triggers the dopamine release in order to program your brain to remember and then want to repeat those behaviors. And so with things like pornography, given the way that it exists, you know, that we talked about earlier, your brain ends up being literally rewired to exponentially crave whatever you've been binging on. So that's where you get into a spiral where you want something, you do it, you secrete lots of dopamine, causes delta phos B to accumulate, that makes the initial urge even stronger, then it rinses and repeats and it gets stronger every time. This is based on the phrase that we mentioned earlier, um, neurons that fire together, wire together, because your brain will strengthen the connection of those cells with repeated activation. And when you link together the nerve cells for sexual excitement with the nerve cells for storing the information associated with that, which would be what you're watching, where you're watching it, how you're watching it, et cetera, it further cements the whole process in your brain because now you'll have totally normal things in your life serving as triggers, which I know is something that we laugh at whenever the left says it, but it's a real thing. So if your parents leave and you suddenly have an urge to watch pornography, if you're so you're agreeing that being triggered is a real thing. You just don't like when people on the left use it? Cool. On your phone, you suddenly had that. Baja, who is a fourth year PhD candidate in uh, developmental genetics says, LMAO, that's not what a transcription factor is, John. <laughs> urge, whatever it may be in your case, that's why your brain has strengthened the association between your sexual excitement and the things that exist independently of and adjacent to that excitement, which makes it so that when you notice those things, or maybe even when you don't notice them, it triggers sexual excitement regardless because you have rewired your brain. Literally the same way that heroin addicts can be triggered by the sight of needles, alcoholics can be uh, Catalina Gearbox with $5 says, I am, I'm drinking to the death of Rush Limbaugh. I invite everyone to join me. <laughs> <laughs> oh boy, please be responsible triggered by the smell of alcohol, it's the same brain mechanisms. And these brain changes tend to keep us over consuming because your brain wasn't designed to handle this level of stimuli. And so it thinks it's just temporarily binging. It just, it doesn't have the capacity to sustainably handle the infinite supply of these supernormal stimuli. And this leads to both addiction and sexual conditioning. So with this, there's good and bad news. The good news is that when you break your addiction, your levels of delta phos B will drop to normal levels after about two months. But the bad news is that the neurological pathways that have been sensitized will remain as such for much longer and possibly even for your whole life, which means that eventually, yeah, the cravings won't be as strong, but if you give in to them again, you'll be back to square one pretty quickly. And I know this might be boring or confusing, but this in itself completely destroys the- It's the first one. It's boring. ...idea that pornography addiction does not exist. The fact that Delta Phos B... I don't think anyone is claiming that pornography... Let me put it this way. No one reasonable is claiming that no one has pornography addiction, John. Pornography addiction absolutely exists, but that's not your claim. Your claim at the beginning of the video is anyone who engages with pornography on any sort of regular basis, even if it's like a once a month thing, is an addict. And that's a ridiculous claim. Be accumulates in the reward center of the brain is now considered to be a sustained molecular switch for both behavioral and chemical addictions. And anyone who tells you otherwise is coping because they're slaves to their carnal desires. Now here's where it starts to get bad because once you're stuck in that cycle where you're craving it and then the more you indulge in it, the more you crave it, etc., your brain actually has a mechanism to try to get you to chill out. And it's a molecule called CREB, we'll call it CREB. And it dampens your pleasure response basically by inhibiting dopamine. And it's your brain's way of trying to make you chill 
chill out on whatever you're binging on, make it less enjoyable so you just kind of relax for a second. And this molecule is actually produced alongside Delta Phos B when you secrete high levels of dopamine. And this is done because at the end of the day, your body's just trying to help you out a little bit, trying to keep you under control, trying to tell you a couple thousand years ago that it's time to leave the blueberry bush, go check on the kids, whatever it may be. But that was long before the utter catastrophe of high-speed internet. So now you have these incredibly powerful reinforcers that override those satiation mechanisms in your brain due to the manner in which they exist. The blueberry bush is much different than an evening spent on Pornhub while drinking Baja Blast and smoking marijuana, basically. <laughs> I'll drink some Baja Blast. This results in desensitization, or in other words, tolerance, which as we know just means that you need more of something to achieve the same effect. And as we also know, this is a key feature of addiction. And with pornography, that might mean watching more of it, watching more extreme versions of it, whatever it may be. And we've already talked about how that type of increased stimulation will elevate your dopamine and confuse you emotionally, etc. But here's a huge takeaway, probably even the biggest takeaway for the average viewer, and that is the fact that the effects of Kreb are not limited to just pornography, because it doesn't exist just for pornography. It exists to dull the effects of pleasure and as a result of this you will start to notice that things in your life that you used to enjoy like hanging out with your friends watching movies playing video games whatever you'll notice that they aren't as enjoyable to you anymore they seem less interesting or even dull that's because of kreb it leaves you bored and less or people have depression people also have depression a lot of people have depression these days john everything is fucked satisfied with your normal life and its activities, which leaves you searching for and prioritizing whatever can elevate your dopamine just so you can feel something again, which for many of us means watching pornography. Now, at this point, you might be asking yourself, now, wait a minute. How can watching pornography increase and decrease my dopamine levels at the same time? Good question. It all comes down to the sequence of events. That's uh, the increase of dopamine activity with sensitization and delta Phos B, and then there's a decrease of dopamine activity with desensitization and CREB. And so for this to make sense, you kind of have to understand, you know, the difference in how your brain regards what you want versus what it likes. So basically, when you're triggered by something to be sexually aroused, the sensitization will cause your dopamine to be spiked. You'll have really strong cravings before you actually start indulging them. Remember that dopamine is the searching for pleasure chemical, not simply just the pleasure chemical. And then once you indulge those cravings, less dopamine. Um, and less God damn, he is repeating himself a lot. Less opioids are secreted, uh, which is the desensitization, which makes it less pleasurable to you than before, which increases your cravings for more, etc. So it's a dangerous cycle to get into because it simultaneously drives your compulsive use while de- Once we hit an hour in this video, I might honestly split this into two parts. Today and tomorrow. Maybe I'll do the second part. I'm definitely streaming tomorrow just because this is fucking arduous. Increasing the fulfillment that you get from that use along with from everyday activities in general, which will make you numb and miserable over time. And this can be corroborated by brain scans that show that pornography addicts have greater activation in their reward systems during the craving phase, but also that they don't actually enjoy pornography more than people who aren't addicted to it. So now, given what we know about how the brain is affected, do you understand how terrible this is, especially for young people, people whose brains are still the most plastic, whose brains are still developing. John, the paper itself even makes a distinction between average porn users and porn addicts. Therefore, if you're going to cite that paper, you should also be able to admit that most people are not porn addicts like you're claiming. They're a subset of a group of people who watch adult material. We are the guinea pigs. We are experiencing a sexual conditioning that our parents could not have even begun to emulate with their Playboys and VHS tapes. Our entire frame of reference for sexuality has been established for us in the form of mass-produced, mass-marketed, super-stimuli that- I mean, maybe you. I've had sexual experiences though, John. So no, mine aren't. I'm an adult person. That would be like saying, how do I, how do I put this? Saying that Porn has changed my expectations of sex would be like saying watching the Avengers has changed my expectation of my vacation to New York City. Like, sure, the Avengers takes place in New York City, at least part of the movie, but I don't expect when I go to New York City I'm gonna see aliens fighting superheroes in the streets. You know what I mean? Porn is just that, it's adult movies? They're movies. They're fake. They're entertainment. It's not meant to be something that's real. I think most people know that.
that exists to addict you for the profit of a select few. It's warping our sexual desires. It's warping our sexual preferences. It's literally making us depressed, as we've discussed. It's making us less attracted to real women. It gives us erectile dysfunction, and it's only going to get worse. It makes you less attracted. John. (laughs) Do you think John is secretly like a sex-repulsed asexual and he doesn't know? And he doesn't understand why all us filthy degenerates want to engage with adult material? friend that would suggest that it gets better because nobody's talking about this no one wants to take action because everyone's addicted to it even back in 2004 as early as 2004 almost 20 years ago there was a study done by swedish researchers that found that 99 percent of young men had consumed pornography and that more than half of them felt yeah i would imagine that statistic is probably about the same throughout most of human history even if we're talking about someone drawing a little stick figure with boobies and jerking off to it People's standards for porn were probably lower in the past, but they were certainly masturbating. (laughs) Let's put it that way. Felt that it had an impact on their sexual behavior. Fast forward to 2016, we have data that shows that 49% of men report viewing pornography that was not previously interesting to them or that they once even considered to be, quote, disgusting. What's more is that fully 20... Wow, we should probably make people more comfortable with engaging with kinks that are not harmful to people huh so they don't have to describe pornography that they view as disgusting percent of them admitted to using pornography to quote maintain arousal with my partner you see the problem there you understand what's wrong with that using the artificial to which you have warped and grounded your desires in order to successfully partake in the natural all right john if you ever have erectile dysfunction i better not catch you taking viagra because that's unnatural If God gives you the floppy dick, you get floppy dick. Period. And the real, think about this for a second and please don't answer aloud. And again, there's no shame in this because everyone is a victim of this in some capacity. But just think to yourself about the most repulsive thing that you've ever gotten off to. I know you know what it is. Ooh, let me think. Hold on. This is going to be tough. Hold on. I actually don't have anything in particular that I would consider repulsive, I don't think. Hold on. Let me think. No, nothing repulsive. He would probably find it repulsive. But, like, nothing harmful. Nothing involving gross stuff. It's just, you know, normal shit, more or less. Baja, Baja's seen the stuff I've looked at before. <laughs> Don't say anything, Baja. <laughs> That's true. John does think anal is repulsive. Know that you know that it's wrong in a clear mind. Now think about how tragic it is that there are people making money off getting 11-year-old boys to watch the same type of stuff, or even more repulsive stuff. John, it's so disingenuous to couch this conversation as if it's about children. When it's really not, it's a parent's responsibility to ensure that their kids aren't engaging with material they don't want them to. If you don't want your kids seeing pornography, set up a block. It's pretty easy to do. Think about whether you've ever had to use pornography to sustain yourself while having sex with your partner. Do you understand the problem with that? Do you understand why that's wrong? And, you know, we'll talk more about this when we get into the societal effects of this stuff. But I want you to just be thinking about that as we go along, because recognizing the degree to which this problem exists or has manifested in your life is keystone to solving it and liberating yourself from it. And with young people, I want to get back to what we talked about earlier with neurons that fire together, wire together, and the association between sexual arousal and the other adjacent factors, because one of the most important things that happens to us as we go through puberty, um, and our brains are still developing until we're like 24, 25, is that we both consciously and unconsciously learn about sex. And part of how this is accomplished is by your brain wiring to respond to sexual cues in your environment. And adolescents wire together these experiences with arousal much faster and much more easily than young adults do, despite an age difference of only a few years. And teenagers are especially vulnerable because their entire reward circuitry is basically just an overdrive the whole time. And as a result of that, they experience an exaggerated version of the cycle that we discussed earlier, which means that they experience higher spikes of dopamine, but also they become bored more easily. And this is because they are more sensitive to dopamine and they also produce more Delta Phos B. So because the adolescent brain is overly sensitive to reward, it is much more vulnerable to addiction. And the scary thing about that is that your brain as an adolescent neurochemically urges you to define sex by whatever offers the biggest buzz, so to speak, which is why the effects of pornography are not the same again lessons and- john made fun of asking for sources for some reason probably because he's not giving what, what's your source on that claim <laughs> what are you 
you talking about? Adults. And this is confirmed by brain scans from a Cambridge study in 2014 because basically your brain naturally sculpts itself to narrow a teen's choices by the time they reach adulthood. And this is because the nerve connections in your brain are governed by a fairly straightforward policy of like use it or lose it, which allows your responses to life to be well honed theoretically. And this is why after you reach about 12, um, your brain actually like shrinks because billions of nerve connections are pruned and reorganized. But the point is that as a teenager, you can literally condition pornography to be your entire sexual frame of reference. You can do this so easily and you've probably already done it to a certain extent such that real sex with a real woman can actually feel like a weird experience to you. <laughs> uh oh. Uh oh. Is John accidentally projecting here? John, if you don't want to have sex with women, don't have sex with women. That's okay. You don't have to. But the I <laughs> I don't guys, how do I help John? How do I help John? Cuz if he's genuinely feeling weird with like <sighs> this or it's less interesting to you because it's deviant from your sexual frame of reference. And this damage is not easy to undo, my friends. I am begging you with tears in my eyes to quit watching this shit now. Your most powerful and lasting memories and habits all arise during adolescence. And while you can liberate yourself from some of this artificial sexual conditioning that we've unfortunately all probably had to experience, it can still be a deep scar in your brain. And the longer you're subject to this conditioning, the worse it's gonna be. Break the conditioning, Western man. Your ancestors did great things back when it was harder to see boobs. That's like. It's literally not a coincidence. Like, we know that your sexuality can be conditioned, and we know that it is even more likely to happen during adolescence. We talked about this earlier, how these associations are formed in your brain with things that aren't even explicitly sexual, and we've confirmed this empirically by doing studies where men view pornography at the same time they view something like a boot or a jar of pennies. And after a while, they become aroused by simply viewing the boot or the pennies without the pornography even present. Because they Yeah, that's that's conditioning. That's, that's classical conditioning. They formed that association in their brains because they have been conditioned. This type of conditioning can affect all sorts of things. I'm including- Just hear what that sicko Pavlov did to his dogs. He made them mouth horny for the bell. Certain visuals, certain objects, scents, even things like animal costumes or sexual partners of the same sex. That's a red pill that most people aren't ready for. I just referred to being hungry as mouth horny and I don't like it. There's a strong argument to be made that taking into account what we've gone over throughout this video, you can understand the path of a prematurely and overly sexualized young man watching more extreme types of pornography, things that make them anxious, things that they know are wrong because those feelings elevate them. They help them to chase that, that elevated dopamine and eventually conditioning himself literally to be a furry or to be sexually attracted to men. Is he implying that pornography is responsible for gay people existing? John, let me introduce you to literally all of ancient Greece. John, gay people exist. Trans people exist. It's fine. It's not the result of pornography. Oh, God. Sure, a lot of it comes down to prenatal hormone exposure in terms of what is ultimately predictive of its manifestation, but the bottom line is that science has never- Fellas, is it gay to watch straight porn? We found a gay gene, and it's certainly never gonna find a furry gene. Do with that as you will. <laughs> How do they normally name genes? Like, what's the no- If someone found a furry gene and didn't call it, like, ooh-woo- six six nine or something then we failed as a species okay baja go find the furry gene and call it uwu okay <laughs> Found out through other brain scan studies that not only can these associations be formed with completely random things like squares or pictures of trees <laughs> oh whoa 420 <laughs> but also that pornography addicts form these associations in their brains faster and more intensely than those who are not addicted to pornography. But the good news is that as it pertains to this type of conditioning, your brain will return to normal after a few months free from whatever you've conditioned it to be aroused to. It will evolve, but backwards. And then once you're in that normal state of mind again, you'll realize how weird those things were. If only there were a word for evolve, but backwards.
Uh, our language has devolved so much. We don't even have a word for that. And the magnitude of the conditioning that you'd undergone. And what's a very important, but perhaps not so obvious consequence of that conditioning? Your PP literally stops working. You as a man have sacrificed the functionality of your PP at the altar of screen whores. Your ancestors aren't <laughs> Ah, they're just disappointed. But before we talk about why this happens, another personal question that I implore you not to answer aloud. Do you still get morning wood, bro? Remember, you'd wake up, you have to go pee, and you have to, like, lean over the toilet until your torso is parallel with your pee-pee? It was a challenge, but it built character, damn it. Okay, first of all, John, that's something that goes away to an extent with age when you're someone with a penis anyway. Um, secondly, me personally, I'm on hormones. But before hormones, yes, yes, I did. And I've been a regular viewer of adult material, who knows, since at least high school, right? And yes, I continued to have that phenomena happen to me every day up until I started using hormones regularly. But the point is that a lot of guys don't even have that anymore and they haven't really noticed it or given it too much thought, but that's a problem. Another problem, we talked about this earlier, symptom of this, uh, being unable to sustain yourself or even get it up, so to speak, when engaging with real women. And I apologize if this is vulgar, but like, come on, man, we're literally talking about pornography here. So to expect TVY7 caliber dialogue would just be unrealistic. But this too is part of erectile dysfunction caused by pornography. And before we get into the data, simply understand that it is not normal for young men to be in these positions and not be good to go. But anyways, there's a couple dozen studies linking sexual dysfunction to pornography use because of everything that we talked about earlier. I I could believe that. I would imagine there's a certain subset of people, probably people who would fall under pornography addicted people who probably do have that problem. That would not surprise me. And this is the part where the pornography addicts chime in like, um, causation does not equal correlation. And it's like, wow, dude, I also have taken statistics 101. Sick, bro. I almost, I almost wish I'd gone to college so that I could write incredibly pretentious academic papers on concepts that I noticed that are just basically Post. Like this one in particular, I see it everywhere. And once you see it, you can never unsee it. I like to refer to it as the horseshoe theory of practical intelligence. And it's basically that in terms of practical intelligence, there is greater unity between those with above average intelligence and below average intelligence than there is between people um, with average intelligence in either of the aforementioned groups. So the both, both ends of the bell curve kind of come together like a horseshoe. And what I think this really comes down to is that people with average intelligence, people who are mediocre, uh, they're still smart enough to realize that they're smarter than some people. And so they cope with their feelings of mediocrity by asserting themselves over those people in ways that are just often incorrect. I'll give you an example. Defund the police. Go ask any stupid person. And I don't mean someone who you disagree with politically. I mean like a legitimately unintelligent person. Ask them what they think about defunding the police. And they will tell you. Now wait just a minute. That's about the dumbest idea I've ever heard. Who's going to catch the criminals, etc. I can only make fun of white people or else I'll get banned. And, you know, if you ask someone with average intelligence, someone who's unexceptional, someone who's probably college educated, go ask them. That's when you're going to get the answer. The IQ of 104. Hey, what do you think about the police? Those are the people who will tell you. Well, crime is caused by circumstance. We need social workers to handle these cases, etc. Whereas if you told an unintelligent person that social workers could prevent these things, they would just laugh at you. Because while they may be unintelligent, they've actually retained more common sense than those with average intelligence because they actually need it to survive and get by in the world. Whereas people with average intelligence don't necessarily need that common sense because they have greater access to opportunity. And of course, if you ask someone with above average intelligence about defunding the police, they'll just laugh at you as well. It's like the sleep woke bespoke meme. And it's the same with this. You got the low IQ people who will say, well, gosh, dang it. I don't want my son watching that internet pornograph. He's going to rot his mind. <laughs> you got the average IQ people like, Actually, studies that have corroborated that have only found associations, and causation does not equal correlation. I am so smart! And then the high IQ people are like, hey, we're not talking about random variables. Like, for example, the fact that there's almost a perfect correlation between U.S. crude oil imports and the domestic per capita consumption of chicken. We're not talking about that. We're actually talking about what we know about neurobiology and neuropsychology, and we're applying... Let's be clear. John, you don't know anything about neurobiology or neuropsychology. Neither do I. But you don't either. So let's not pretend you do, okay?
applying that appropriately and saying, hey, given what we know about this, we predict that with this new epidemic of pornography consumption, this is what's probably going to happen. These are the effects that will manifest. And then, oh, wait a minute, exactly what would logically be expected to happen has happened, and it's reflected in our research. But then the 104 IQ people are like, no, but I must be smart. Causation does not equal correlation. Those are my least favorite types of people. Everyone thinks I'm a eugenicist. I want to get rid of the lower people. I just want to get rid of the people in the middle. They're annoying. Low IQ nationalism. I'm here for it. Lower people. I just want to get rid of the people in the middle. They're annoying. Low IQ nationalism. I'm here for it. Can I get a clip, please? Clip. Someone clip. Thank you. But that aside, it's also basically impossible to do experiments on this, the effects of this type of stuff because you can't find a control group of men who haven't been exposed to it anymore. We'll get more into that in a second, but essentially what happens is that because of your sexual conditioning, you have certain expectations wired into your brain. And dopamine will elevate when something is better than you expected, but it'll also drop when something isn't as good as you expected. And once you've conditioned yourself to internet pornography, real sex is never going to be able to meet that expectation because it can't compete with all of the variables that classify it as a supernormal stimulus. And resultantly, your unconscious expectations probably won't be met, and your dopamine will drop, which means your pee pee will drop because you need <laughs> consistent dopamine to maintain sexual arousal and a functioning pee pee. When it comes to PP functionality, I trust the science. And the science says that you need adequate dopamine in your reward circuitry and in the sexual centers of your brain. And obviously, there are different types of erectile dysfunction. Sometimes it's caused by things like blood vessels or nerve problems. But we're talking about psychological causes. And if you look at scans of gray matter in the brain's reward center, in the brain's sexual centers, in the hypothalamus, you'll find that lost gray matter equates with loss of nerve cell branches and connections with other nerve cells, which means that it's not just performance anxiety, but it can also be a literal consequence of changes to the reward circuitry of your brain, which have resulted in persistently reduced dopamine signaling, which explains why your morning wood is gone and why it's going to take months to come back once you start to break this conditioning. And this matches the results of another brain scan study conducted in Germany um, and published in JAMA Psychiatry. The results are less gray matter and general desensitization, which is what we talked about earlier. And you can measure things like gray matter and desensitization in a brain scan. But the nucleus of your sexual conditioning, so to speak, the real magnitude of it can't be articulated on paper by some lab coat. That's something that will ultimately be dependent on your level of honesty and self-understanding. But to get back into the addiction components of it, because anybody who hears this can just dismiss it by saying, well, as long as it's not addictive, who cares? You you can just stop anytime you want. We've already talked about those types of people and classified them properly as people who are basically coping by rationalizing their sexual degeneracy. We've also talked about the- Oh, I don't need to rationalize my sexual degeneracy. I love it. Characteristics of this addiction, specifically that just like substance addiction, it elevates your dopamine significantly, which is why the same nerve cells are active as when cocaine and methamphetamine are used, and that this is different from all other natural rewards. And even though addictions are not all the same, we still know that they all essentially cause the same core changes to your brain, which can be summarized basically as a craving and preoccupation with doing whatever it is that you're addicted to, a loss of control with how much you're doing it and the ways in which you're doing it, and also the negative um, consequences of you doing it, whether those are financial, physical, mental, social, doesn't matter. So Again, John, if you're having physical, mental, I'm sorry, I'm tired. Hey, a long day. Um, if you're having physical, mental, financial issues with pornography usage, then yes, you have an addiction, and that's something that you need to address, either on your own or with the help of a therapist or something, whatever. But that's not most people who watch pornography, John! You're using people... How do I put this? It would be like me pointing at alcoholics and saying, okay, so all alcohol should be banned, even though a majority of people handle alcohol just fine and can do so reasonably responsibly. That's not how this works. So what's interesting about this is that we- It's so funny because he's he so often is like, oh, personal responsibility is great and it's people's own problems and there aren't like, how do I put this? There aren't systemic issues in regard to like racial problems, but all of a sudden it's a s systemic issue that people watch porn and he thinks this is something that needs to be addressed. John Doyle doesn't just want to tell you porn is bad. John Doyle would ban porn legally if he could. Like, <laughs> it's just very, very ridiculous.
know that the substances that follow this pattern can and do create addictions, but they're much more infrequent than you would think. It only causes about 10 to 15 percent of human and animal test subjects to become addicted um, when trials are conducted. But we have to be very careful with the conclusions that we're drawing from this. So you just admitted 10 to 15 percent of people who watch porn regularly are in that, like, hyper category of people who are considered addicts, yet you're still talking about pornography in general as if it is a problem for most people. I'm curious what percentage of people who, like, drink are addicted, like, and I mean, like, alcoholic addicted to uh, drinking. I wonder if it's a higher or lower percentage. Let me see. Just curious. What percent of... Drinkers are alcoholics. Ten percent of U.S. adults who drink too much are alcoholics, so about the same. Ten to fifteen percent is what he said. This says ten percent. So it just appears that with any pleasurable activity, and this is only two data points, so bear that in mind. I recognize that. But at least with that, it doesn't seem that out of line. A pleasurable activity about 10 to 15 percent of the population will become addicted to that probably because that's about the amount of a population who has sort of an addictive personality or has that sort of reward system that works specifically in the ways that he's describing but that's not the majority of people and for the same whatever john do you i i'm i'm just so over it at this point because it's not that we're safe from addiction, but rather that we're relatively safe from those specific addictions. But in terms of natural rewards, things like those supernormal stimuli that we discussed earlier, things like junk food, you're not safe at all. Why is this? Why is it that even if you're not susceptible to addiction, why is it that you can still get extremely addicted to supernormal stimuli in the forms of junk food and pornography? I don't know. Maybe because your brain is designed to pursue food and sex. Maybe that's why. Food and sex are S tier, drugs and alcohol are lower. How many people are addicted to drugs and alcohol? I don't know, but I do know that 70% of American adults are overweight and fully 37% of them are obese. That's going to cause a lot more deaths than drugs are. Libertarians are like, yeah, he wants a small government to legalize all drugs. Nice try. I actually want a big government to usher in state-enforced physical fitness. That's a joke. Kind of. The point is that we know what... Ah... <sighs> That supernormal stimulus is doing to American society. Now, what if you had one that was available in even greater quantity, novelty, and it was totally free? Not good, folks. Not good. And it's difficult to find data on this because it tends to be something done in private. But we've got data from 2014 that found that 33% of men between the ages of 18 and 30 either thought they were addicted or were unsure, which is significantly more than the just 5% of men between the ages of 15 and 68 who felt the same. Then we've got two studies from 2016, both found that it was about 28%. Now, even ignoring what we know about the upward trends in terms of how many people are addicted, the age at which they're getting addicted, and even ignoring how catastrophic it would be for society if even just 28 or 33% of the men were addicted to pornography, which we'll elaborate upon later. I'm going to just go ahead and assert that about 85% of men in this country are addicted to porn. 85%. That's the <laughs> You literally took the inverse of the, the stat. The stat earlier said 10 to 15%. And you're literally flipping it to say, actually, no, it's the opposite. That's not how statistics work. You can't just say, I think 85 per Okay. I think... 99% of John's audience are idiots. Anyone could just make up numbers, John. <laughs> the figure. What's my source? My feelings. I just, I... <laughs> what, what? Well, there it is, isn't it? What, what do you want me to do with that, John? What the fuck do you want me to do with that? feel that this is true. And if you've consumed pornography in the last 365 days, you're not allowed to dispute this because your consciousness is corrupted by desire and addiction. <laughs> if you have coomed in the last year, then you are a degenerate. You gotta be like John. John never cooms, okay? He's a real American, okay? No American lets any woman touch his pee-pee, okay? <laughs> what the fuck, John? You simply can't see the same things that I can see. Your third eye is, is calcified by the smut and tarnish of lust. It oh, no. My third eye is very cleared out. I cleared that pipe <laughs> earlier this week. <laughs> At least 85%. And anyone who tells you otherwise is trying to hurt you. All jokes aside, uh, one of the first figures that we went over was 80% of men watching pornography at least once a week. Given what we've been talking about, I find it very hard to believe that they're not addicted. And then I myself... Why? Again, John, 
you're a college graduate who wears a suit in his parents' house and films internet videos. Now, don't get me wrong, I'm not doing much better. I'm a college dropout, but at least I own my own house and that's pretty nice. Neither of us are qualified to make statements on this except to rebut each other. Just seems stupid. Threw in an extra 5% for good measure. There we have it, 85% at least. And remember, anyone who tells you otherwise is trying to hurt- Did I say college graduate? I meant he's a high school graduate and I'm a college dropout. My bad. Chew. Now that being said, a lot of people, even in the medical and scientific fields, think that, uh, well, we can't use what we know about addiction to understand compulsive behaviors like gambling and pornography use, and there's just no such thing as a behavioral addiction. That's what they say. Only substance addictions, like with heroin and the other drugs that we- I think most people recognize that there are things other than actual physical dependence. Like, addiction is different than dependence. You can be physically dependent on certain things and not on other things. Like, uh, uh, weed is a good example. You can become addicted to weed. People laugh at that, but you can. You can become addicted to anything that makes you feel good, but you aren't physically dependent like you can get on alcohol or heroin or meth or some of those other drugs. I mentioned earlier. Basically, the difference being you go into, like, physical withdrawals if you stop having that drug or whatever it happens to be. And this is often promoted by the media, um, but the most updated research that we have actually contradicts this idea. For example, if you look in the DSM-5, addiction is one of the only mental disorders that can be reproduced at will in a laboratory setting. In other words, we know exactly how to make animals and people addicted to something, and we can do it whenever we want to. Wouldn't it be a shame if oligarchs use this knowledge to harm and profit off our society? Okay, relax, relax. The point is that we can- Oh, so John's beef is with capitalism again. Cool study what happens to the brain in these settings even down to the molecular level and what we find with thousands of brain studies whether it's addiction to methamphetamine heroin whatever is that all addictions modify the same fundamental brain mechanisms and produce a recognized set of anatomical and chemical alterations there is no doubt amongst addiction experts that behavioral and chemical addictions are fundamentally the same we've got like 230 brain studies on internet addicts that reveal the same they're very much physically different and um... Your, your pleasure centers are probably going to be affected very similarly, but when we're talking about, like, physical dependence, it involves, like, what happens if you stop taking heroin, cold turkey, or stop taking alcohol, cold turkey, if you're, like, a severe alcoholic, and you have those symptoms, that's a physical dependence as opposed to an addiction, and you can have an addiction and a physical dependence, they aren't mutually exclusive terms. Same changes that we've been talking about in substance addicts. So if we know that the internet is addictive, it's evident that contemporary pornography is as well. And sure enough, this is confirmed by the brain studies on people who watch pornography. Baha, who again is a fourth year PhD candidate in developmental genetics, says, how does he think he has the, th the authority to say, quote, there is no doubt by the experts that this dot dot dot. That would be because John is a big boy who wears a suit and a tie. And that gives him the authority to say whatever he wants. He's a high school graduate, okay? He knows what he's talking about. There was a landmark review. I will cut this into. At the hour mark, we're gonna pause until tomorrow, and I'll finish it on tomorrow's stream. Sorry, guys. I didn't mean to be so sleepy. You done recently, which outlined the four fundamental brain changes caused by addiction. They might ring a bell, and they are sensitization, desensitization, dysfunctional prefrontal circuitry, and a malfunctioning stress system. And studies on contemporary pornography users find evidence of each of these. Start with the first one, sensitization. That can be defined as an unconscious super memory of pleasure, which when activated triggers powerful cravings. Your parents leave, all of a sudden you feel compelled to watch pornography. Uh, you're stressed out, same thing happens. You see a model on Instagram, that's what that is. There's that's interesting. I've heard, I guess I've heard other people say that. I've never been stressed out and decided to, like, partake in that particular activity in order to relieve that stress. I don't know. I just would rather be relaxed if I'm going into that sort of activity, I guess. There's about 20 studies reporting sensitization and cue reactivity in pornography users. And even when you try to quit or you don't use it for a while, those sensitized pathways are still there and they grow even stronger for a while. Your reward system is literally begging you to stimulate it. And with that sensitization amplified, your brain's reward center uses the same mechanisms involved in normal learning and memory. And it might get weaker once you quit after a while, but they're going to remain there for a very long time, depending on how intense your addiction was. That's why so many anti-addiction organizations advocate complete abstinence from whatever you're addicted to, because anything else 
will sustain those developed pathways, which won't allow you to get better. And then we get into the second one, which is desensitization, which is basically a numbed response to that pleasure. This is typically the first addiction-related brain change that addicts notice. Basically, the reduced dopamine and opioid signaling uh, leaves you less sensitive to everyday pleasures and starving for things that will raise those levels again. And this is the cycle of tolerance with which we're all familiar. You need more of something to achieve the previous effect, and it keeps getting worse and worse. And we talked earlier about how your brain will release CREB to inhibit dopamine in your reward circuitry, which will then decrease as you abstain from your vice. But this itself doesn't really explain why people still feel numb and depressed even months after quitting their vice. And that's because the more lasting causes would be things like lost gray matter, declining dopamine and opioid receptors, which literally means that instead of your brain just protecting itself from excessive um, stimulation with CREB, it's also going to remove some of your receptors so that you're less sensitive to the stimulation. It literally removes your D2 receptors so that you're less sensitive to the stimulation. And D2 receptors just so happen to help control cravings. So without them, your cravings are going to be that much harder to control. On the bright side, your brain can rebuild these receptors over time, but you know, you're gonna have to quit frying your reward circuitry first. And it's this imbalance that is the biggest driver of addiction. You're dealing with incredibly powerful cravings that keep increasing in intensity and then experiencing less pleasure in everyday life because of desensitization, which makes you gravitate towards the things that give you the most dopamine because you just want to feel something, basically. Remember, fellas, you're not horny, you're just depressed. <laughs> John, people can be both. And there have been at least six studies confirming these neurological effects in pornography users. After that, we I think that describes a good portion of my audience. Horny and depressed. <laughs> get into the dysfunctional prefrontal circuitry, which manifests as your willpower being weakened and you become hyper reactive to the cues that trigger your behavior. And this is because your prefrontal cortex is the part of your brain that basically governs your actions. It's where you plan things, evaluate consequences, costs, benefits, etc. And most importantly, it governs your willpower and tells you not to do things that you might regret later. And there are two types of pathways extended into our reward system from it. One of them says do it, the other says don't do it. So if the emotional centers in your reward system want you to hit somebody, the prefrontal cortex will be like, hey dear guy, let's think about this first. But with addiction, the pathways that encourage behavior become increasingly powerful, while the pathways that discourage and inhibit behavior become increasingly weak. It's literally like you've got, you know, the angel and the devil on your shoulder, but the angel's just a regular dude, and the devil's pumping steroids into himself. He's like Bane. And we found physical evidence of this in fMRI studies and also evidence through specialized psychological testing. And this can be reflected in at least 13 studies of pornography users. And then the last one, the malfunctioning stress system, which means that your cravings are strong. Baha says, okay, but John, what if you replace all this porn with sex? Like if one tanks your reward system, the other would too. So should people not have sex either? That's what I'm saying. Doesn't really make sense. Stronger, your willpower is weaker. You've got a lot of withdrawal symptoms. This is because your stress system is a little bit more nuanced than just fight or flight. It also modifies your brain to protect itself from long-term stressors. And experts view addiction as a stress disorder because it not only affects your stress hormones uh, like adrenaline and cortisol, but it also induces several changes in your brain's stress system. And there are three changes in particular that make it extremely difficult to quit. The first is that stress increases dopamine and cortisol, which means that even something only slightly stressful can trigger your cravings, even if there's nothing to trigger it directly. The sensitized addiction pathways are already there and those in themselves are enough. The second one is that stress inhibits the prefrontal cortex, which means that your impulse control and ability to fully comprehend the consequences of your actions are both inhibited. And lastly, when you're- Stone Corbell says, so experts are good here, but not in studies that refute what you're saying. That's the funny thing. There are plenty of experts who will be like, hey, you know, porn's fine in moderation like all things. There are even studies that do show like it can be stress relieving again, as long as you're not in- some sort of sex addiction. You don't have some sort of sex addiction or whatever. Uh, uh, major, like, medical associations like the American Medical Association and the American Psychological Association are on board with transition in terms of trans people. But I doubt John cares about experts in that case because it disagrees with what he's saying. <laughs> kind of funny. Republicans love sources and experts when they think it backs up their case. But when it doesn't, all of a sudden they're elitists. They're elitist liberals. Addicted to something and you don't give it to your brain, your brain basically freaks out and your stress system goes into overdrive. This is what causes withdrawal symptoms like anxiety, depression, being tired, insomnia, irritability, mood swings, etc. If this sounds like you, take note of that. Remember, you're not depressed, you're just addicted to pornography. We've got three studies that demonstrate these dysfunctional stress systems in pornography users, and even one of them showed that it was epigenetically altering your stress genes. So to summarize these four neuroplastic brain changes, you're like, hey, this is epic. Your brain's like, yeah, do more. 
your brain's like, no, this isn't epic. In fact, very little of anything is epic anymore. And then your brain's like, do more of the originally epic thing. And your brain's also like, I literally just can't even stop you at this point. And then collectively, no one's having a good time. Basically, you get the point. And coom brains <laughs> used to be like, there's no such thing as porn addiction. No symptoms. We need studies. And so in 2017, we had two studies that confirmed these yeah. symptoms in pornography users. Another one just with internet addicts who were also pornography addicts. And then three more um, with escalation and tolerance as it pertains to pornography. And then another 14 more with that escalation into weirder genres, which is part of the tolerance aspect of pornography addiction. So basically, we say yet again, anyone who tells you that this isn't real or that it isn't a problem is a coping addict who should not be listened to. Again, I don't think the vast majority of people say porn addiction isn't real, John. Porn addiction is absolutely real, but it's not something that's suffered by the vast majority of people who partake in adult content. Baha says, I would pay John money if he could give me a correct description of epigenetics. <laughs> okay, I'll save this to watch later and we will finish this up tomorrow. This will be part one. But gosh, we've been going for, for, I can only handle so much John in one day. So we'll come back and finish that up tomorrow. Let's do a cleanse and then we'll call it a night. <laughs>